wisdom hits Satan in the dick, right? <laughs> I mean, ma maybe that's what Buddha knows best. You know, that's maybe where his wisdom is centered. He just knows a, a lot about dicks. As far as I understand it, Satan gets hit in the dick by Buddha's wisdom, and then he's like, oh, fuck it, I'm going home, and disappears. Yeah, yeah, so you know how you get people who are like, they're not book smart, but they're street smart? Like, Buddha's that, he's not book smart, he's dick smart. <laughs> there and you go. That's, he just knows a lot about dick. God awful movie. 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 Welcome back to God Awful Movies, where each week we watch another terrible movie so you don't have to. Except, of course, when my internet goes out for two days and then comes back about 20 minutes before we start recording. <laughs> so I'll be learning about this movie at the same time as everyone listening at home. Get excited. I'm your host, Heath Enright, and sitting about 600 miles to my immediate left is my good friend, Eli Bosnick. Eli, are you... Are you ready to explain this koan of a film to me? Oh, I sure am, Heath. Now, let me explain. Usually, like, we've had internet outages or people get busy before and we just postpone the record. But this movie is so ridiculous, so insane, that the prospect of describing <laughs> it to Heath rather than describing it with Heath <laughs> was too tempting to resist. Fantastic. I'm very excited to hear what happened i don't i don't know if you're going to be able to do it we'll we'll find out and sitting about 3800 miles to my left or about 14000 miles in the other direction if you go the other way enjoying the small island remnant of a global empire is my great friend michael marshall marsh welcome back Hey, good, good to speak to you, Heath. Nice to be back on the show, Heath Eli. I was actually slightly disappointed there, Heath, that you didn't then start telling me how far away I am if you go across the North Pole or around the bottom of the South. <laughs> That's kind of homework for next time. And also, I was feeling great up until the point where I found out you hadn't seen this film because I didn't know that not watching this film was an option for being on the show having not watched the film. So it is. Not, did your internet just go out? That's so weird. <laughs> to be fair, Marsh. Us describing this film to you is your other show, Be Reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> this is just the version where you don't have to be polite. That's very true. <laughs> Excellent. Well, let's explain what's happening here. Tell us, Marsh, what are we going to be breaking down today? So we watched The Laws of the Sun, and it's the animated tale of the many reincarnations of the great alien sun god, El Cantare. Fantastic. And you know this film has to be all completely true, because the guy who wrote this film says he is the reincarnation of the great alien sun god, El Cantare. <laughs> and, and why would a wise and powerful sun god lie? That's the question that I've got for you. you. Um, so, you know, long story short, I, I've joined a cult uh, having watched <laughs> hey! this film. I'm in. I am in. Yeah. Congratulations. Don't open any <laughs> envelopes that they send you. Just the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they got like kicked out of their New York spot for violating all the COVID like social distancing stuff. <laughs> <laughs> they, they were they were selling DVDs that they claimed would improve your immunity to it. They yeah. did a whole bunch. This cult is terrifying. Wow, yeah. really? I didn't know about that. Yeah. Movie. They're actually called Happy Science Cult. Well, we did one other movie by them, right? Two. Yeah. Well, Two other movies. Two, oh, right. Two of them? Wow. Yeah. I've just conflated so many things in my head over these years. <laughs> All right, Eli, tell us, how bad was this movie? Well, if you love anime, but the plots of Naruto, Bleach, and Avatar are too straightforward and realistic, <laughs> you will love this movie. <laughs> this movie is so fantastic because unlike the other films where the protagonist discovered the crazy. This is just like a history lesson about the craze. Just a straight phone. There's no surprises. It's just being described. It's fantastic. It's a history book movie about this cult about aliens and the light god of the sun? Yes. Th that's what I'm going to learn about? Yeah, it's like someone created a movie just so Texas textbooks would have something to make fun of. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's fucking stupid. <laughs> and is there anything you guys would like to nominate this one for being the best at being the worst at? 
So I was pretty close to saying best worst cast of alien gods. Ooh. But I'm not even going to say that now because now that I know Heath hasn't seen it, I want to get to that point in real time so we can drop that on <laughs> Heath when he's not expecting it. So in the meantime, I'm going to say best worst chronology because at every point in this film, they start throwing kind of the date or how long ago stuff is at you. And it's all just the, just insane numbers. So, you know, the universe started 100 billion, 100 billion years ago. Human mm. beings are 200 million years ago and somehow nope. preceded dinosaurs. What? All of their numbers are inconsistent and ridiculous. <laughs> and I, I even have a theory. I think this film was made, uh, the Japanese filmmakers made this film uh, so it could be shown to your racist uncle the next time he tries to use the stereotype of Asians being good with numbers. So you can say, well, actually, they're just as flawed as everybody else, you racist. That's that's my theory about the film. Oh. Why would they get all that stuff wrong? This cult started in 1986. We yeah. had correct numbers to her. They could base at least that on some reality. No. <laughs> See, I was going to go with best worst peripheral crazy, right? Because <laughs> this movie is crazy. It's chock full of crazy, right? It is packed. Oh, crazy. It's oops, all crazy. But <laughs> there's this beautiful amount of peripheral crazy on the signs where they'll just be like, and then obviously the Martians from Epsilon Prime, <laughs> they came over to lend them their space lasers. <laughs> but this is a creation myth. So it's not like, hey, who did Adam and Eve's children marry? It's like, wait, why are there space police? We'll get to it. We'll get to it. There's going to be space police? Not only are there going to be space police, we're never going to be introduced to the space police. We're just going to watch Jew lizards try to get around the space police. Buckle the fuck in, he said, right? Buckle in. We need need to defund the space police. (laughs) Okay, well, all that sounds pretty fucking stupid. So... I'm going to go with best, best timing by Cincinnati Bell Phyoptics. Great job, guys. <laughs> but despite their best efforts, I'm still going to learn about this movie, apparently. And we're going to take a quick break. And then we'll be back for the apparently intergalactic Jesus Buddha cult classic, The Laws of the Sun. Somewhere in Japan. Excuse me. Excuse me, sir. Sir. Oh, y- yeah, yeah. Can I talk to you for a minute? Oh, I've, I've actually, I've got to catch a bus right now. I've, so I've, I've here's got... the thing. Venus Martians, right? They came to Earth along with 10% of the other aliens from the Astro Belt to fulfill Sky Buddha's wish for perfect enlightenment. Right. Right, yeah. But there were also spirit souls who came along to guide humans in each incarnation so they didn't end up like the soulless clones that turned into the demons and the devil. Right. Yeah, of course. Of course. Of course yeah, yeah. yeah. And as luck would have it right now, ultimate Buddha has incarnated on Earth so we can all be the perfect versions of our souls. Well, that's lucky. Um, yeah. Hey, just quick question. Uh huh. Yeah. What's up? Is there any chance at all that I could pay animators to spend hundreds of hours to turn all of what you just said into a movie? Ooh. Uh, Do you promise to cover the reptilian plot to corrupt the ancient Incas as a workaround of the space police? Yes. Then yes. Excellent. And we're back. And we're going to start this one off with, um, uh, what? What (laughs) What happened? (laughs) A little pre-movie reading assignment. Some reading. (laughs) Great. Cold open on reading. So I didn't get the pre-read because I think I was watching a different cut of the film, a a different link to it. And it's only when I saw your notes, Eli, that I saw that you'd seen a whole section of it with a reading before. And I thought, no, I've I've already seen this film now. And you can get (laughs) fucked if you think I'm going to go back and do the pre-read after I've seen this film. So you're Uh, on your own for the first minute. (laughs) I don't know. Marsh, I think you should go back and do the reading. Take it seriously. You're supposed to watch the movie. (laughs) Movie review show. (laughs) <laughs> but yeah, we're going to start with a couple of quotes from Nostradamus here. <laughs> and they're just like, um, he liked the number seven. Something would happen during a time of great games and slaughter. <laughs> and now on with the show. It was like someone let their son like make the opening thing. And they were like, OK, OK, now you can do the movie. But this is this is the problem when you're making a film made by like written by a cult leader who 
if you listen to him, has written like 50,000 books or something. He claims, Ryo Okawa, the, the guy who started Happy Signs, claims to have written on average four books a day for the last 60 years or something like that. So he's just clearly a kind of guy who just sits in front of a typewriter and bashes out words. And then he's got an entire industry around him to try and make those words sound prophetic or interesting or profound. And so his nonsense words have to be attached to this in some way. So you kind of get acclimatized and, and given the gravitas of Ryu Akawa. So yeah, that's what's going on here, I reckon. Yeah, th that cult is the worst, by the way. Like we said, they're founded in 1986. And apparently they're just like, like, Reagan plus magic is seems to be their theme. They're the yeah. worst. They're like, they deny a bunch of, like almost Holocaust denier level stuff. Like they deny all of the bad history of Japan and they're neoconservatives. They're terrible. They're, they're pro-nuclear weapons, which is a bold stance for a Japanese <laughs> cult to take. So I, I knew a bit about this cult going into the film because I went to the, the Happy Science Centre in London and I sat in a room for a screening of Ryu Okawa's seance with Princess Diana, where he channeled Princess Diana. What? And the screening was advertised. I phoned them up to get a ticket. They were like, yeah, I mean, we can do it, but you're the only one who's expressed any interest. <laughs> so I went along. And then when I got there, they were like, there's one other person coming. So do you mind if we start late? And so it got to like 10 past the hour that was supposed to start and somebody else walked in, but he walked in from the other part of the building, not from the outside world. He'd clearly come downstairs from the, in their office. So clearly they've gone, well, we need another person in here. We'll just pretend you're it. So he comes in and sits down. And then as the film starts, someone else walks in. Oh, and it was the most awkward experience. So I know a bit about the cult from, from that experience. Wow. Oh, the amazing. audience was one troll, you, <laughs> yeah. and one plant <laughs> yes. from upstairs. <laughs> yeah, while well, well, we watched a grainy, badly subtitled film of a, let's let's say the words Japanese, probable liar, pretending to channel a dead British princess. God. And then they made this movie. I'm and really excited to And that. I was going to say, and this is a movie version. This is the anime <laughs> version of that film. Yeah, this is the explanation of what was going on. <laughs> Okay, so what happens next, guys? I'm excited. <laughs> All right, so now it's time to really dig into the bullshit. And I want to say at the outset, I think J.J. Abrams might be part of the happy science cult because they seem to have a, a real dedication to lens flare there at the end. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was pretty constant. I also like the fact that one of the production companies was Go Fuck You Films. This was made by Go Wait. Fuck You Films. Really? <laughs> it's K-O-F-U-K-U, Kofuku, but it's like, Go, go fuck you films. Okay. Well, I mean, I read your notes trying to have some idea of what happened in this movie. And I can definitely co-fuck myself. So I can <laughs> Yeah. And we're going to open with this narration, which I fucking love. We make it. Well, we already made it zero seconds. We made it negative something seconds before it was crazy. But this is the first narration. There is a term for Buddha's truth. It is... Buddha's truth. Don't say Fuck, Buddha's can truth. I start again? I wonder, can I start my movie over? God, it's animated too. I feel like I had so much time. <laughs> so is it part Buddhist? Is that part of the mythology? Uh, spoilers, Heath, but yes. Great. Yeah, it, it's not that its mythology is Buddhist. It's that Buddha is thisist, it, it turns out. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Okay. And so, little history for you. A hundred billion years ago, the great spirit, El Cantare, <laughs> did nothing. Did nothing. Okay. <laughs> just was. Just was about then at some point. Yeah. <laughs> yep. But then 80 billion years ago, the great cosmic spirit created everything. Which means that this movie needed us to know that the great cosmic spirit chilled for at least 20 billion years. Yeah. <laughs> And they also describe it as being the creation of the 13th dimensional cosmic spirit. So, but if, if there was nothing, um, you haven't created the 13th dimension. You've created the first dimension. You've, you've, you, you can't <laughs> count your dimensions down. It's, that's not how counting works. Well, you know, they're stealing from the Bible. It's the idea of like, you can make the water before he makes the earth kind of thing. I feel like they're, they're copying yeah, off the Bible's homework. You can't make the homework. 13th thing before you make the 12th <laughs> thing or the 11th thing or the 10th thing. That's fair. And, and that is in fact what they will do. They will now count down billions of years with the great <laughs> spirit making the 12th dimension, obviously then the 11th, then the 10th. But he's working faster and faster on each dimension, which I guess is why our dimension fucking sucks. He only spent like 3 billion years on it instead of 20 or whatever. 
And it also points out, it says that the great spirit was striving for infinite growth. And I wrote my notes, oh, great. So he's a neoconservative then. He believes that <laughs> infinite growth is the, the way to happiness. <laughs> but then we get to some hard science. 40 billion years ago, the Big Bang. <laughs> I feel he could have looked this up. It's <laughs> really real easy to Google. It, it didn't need to be 40 billion. If they had said 13.8 billion years ago, it would have made no material difference to anything in this film if they had just gone the Big Bang was when we know the Big Bang happened. It would have made no difference. They could have just carried on with that. Wait, hold on. Now, now the infinite Buddha is just sitting there doing nothing for a bunch of extra years. That's like <laughs> 27. Hey, that sounds stupid. We're doing, we're doing 40. I like nice round numbers. Round numbers. <laughs> And this is also the first time that we see characters on screen at the same time as the subtitles, which is where I got to watch Marsh discover that the subtitles in the Happy Science Cult movies do not match up with the dubbing in the Happy Science Cult oh, movies. What? <laughs> so frustrating. The words on screen don't match the words you're hearing. And it's so disorienting. It was constantly throwing me. And I had a theory about this. I think the, the subtitles were transcribed by the guy who recorded the voiceover, but from memory, he had to work back from memory. And so was, uh, I think we said something about grace, was it? That, that's what's going on. Maybe the Buddha didn't invent how subtitles work until partway through. <laughs> yeah, no, we got a couple billion years before he gets to that. And then we get the title card again, the laws of the sun. <laughs> so now we're going to cut to some people who will appear throughout the movie, but will never be explained. They're talking about the plot of the movie. They're like a council of wise people, and they're standing around a book that says the laws of the sun. Yes, and there's five of them, and they're standing around a, a pentagonal table. And I just wrote like, who buys pentagonal tables? Because you can't put them up against a wall. They don't tessellate, so you can't expand. You can't put two of them together. I mean, they're just really lucky that whoever bought it only had four friends. But I've never seen a pentagonal table. 20 billion of those years was just trying to push the tables together. No, okay, there's still a gap. Oh, this is stupid. This is a, we need. Oh. I'm, I'm inventing rectangles. This is ridiculous. <laughs> Can someone make that Escher guy? <laughs> <laughs> What's really frustrating as well is they, they open the book that's on the table and they start talking about 100 billion years ago. So it's like we just, we've only just started the film and now you're recapping the start of the film. Like you didn't, if you're going to tell us it now, you didn't need to tell us it then. This is just entirely superfluous. Yeah, I was really worried we were going to get an infinite regression there for a second. And <laughs> the 100 billion years ago pans down to the five people around the table. Ah, oh, fuck, we're back around the table again. <laughs> And they say as well, 100 billion years ago, Buddha, which they transcribe as God, but or they say God, but transcribe as Buddha. It's one way around like that. But Buddha intended to build the universe. And the wording of that makes it sound like he never quite got around to it, like it was on his to-do list, but he's had a load of other stuff to get done to yeah. first. You know how you always want to do that thing where you trace around the tools in your garage? Buddha felt that way about creating the universe. He wants to do it, but... How's that going, buddy? You know, that universe you've been working on? You getting, getting that done during the quarantine? No. Yeah. <laughs> but 5.5 uh, billion years ago, he made... Keith, any guesses? Um, Venus, correct. He made Venus. Venus. <laughs> the first 13th planet. The first Venus. planet was yeah. Venus. Got it. Yeah. And if, you, if you're wondering how he made Venus, well, uh, he's Buddha, so he I can was. just like send out a, a, a zap of energy. But it, there's no point zapping directly to Venus. That would be too easy. So instead, he bounces the energy off the sun, which is just a really weird showing off moment to go for a trick shot. The, there's nothing <laughs> else. You're not having to swerve around a planet or like go off the cushion or anything. But you know, you're bouncing it off the sun to, to just show off at this point. Right. And I know what you're thinking. Did Buddha get in there with his bare hands and start making humans or whatever. No, you stupid, stupid fool. He made El Miore, the first dimensional great spirit. No, no, he was the first ninth dimensional great That's spirit. That's right, sorry. He's the first ninth dimensional great spirit. Yeah. What? Yeah, yeah. It, it, the direct quote is, this was El Miore, the first ninth dimensional great spirit of the solar system who was responsible for creating lives on Venus. And we are less than five minutes in. And we're already pretty packed in tight in terms of the bullshit. <laughs> is, is he the great spirit of like length and also <laughs> nine <laughs> we, dimension? What, we can what? hope so. Uh, so we, we watch him go through a couple of iterations. It's not the creation myth because first... <laughs> He makes a combo of plants and animals. And then yeah, so he's like, 
eh, don't love these. <laughs> yeah, he's like, really? he makes these giant walking flowers and you see them all sort of collected and he's like, no, actually, this is insane. What am I thinking? This was a, <laughs> a massive mistake. That sounds amazing. So the next thing he makes is a sparkly golden phoenix that shits seashells filled with horses. Correct. I think is yes. what was going okay. on. Mm -hmm. He gives that a try, but it's not quite his style. So eventually he makes humans or... <laughs> Or souls. It's unclear. Blobs of gold appear and then they slowly turn into white people. Yes, they, they do. They do. Man, stick with the walking plants. That sounds great. <laughs> like if we had chloroplast, like we could like photosynthesize and just be like, oh, yeah, I'm a little hungry. Yeah. Let me just get a little sun. That sounds amazing. First answer, best answer. Exactly. Shouldn't have changed his mind. Right. <laughs> so Venus is filled with these golden human whatevers and it's time to assess the progress. Yeah, and they've done pretty well, to be fair. I was I was pretty sceptical about the uh, capabilities of those Venusian folk, but they've made a thriving city. They've got very clearly the White House there on Venus, just in the background <laughs> to show how civilized they are. Yeah. Oh. Solid guys. Yeah, and so they, they were informed that they made a utopian society on Venus. But, you know, the kind of utopian society where... Everyone's dressed like ancient Greeks, I guess. Yes, yeah, yeah. But by utopia, they mean they were white and they wore togas. That's that's their idea of a utopian society. So Buddha, who I guess has been distracted with other stuff, maybe he had a, a bad divorce going on at home. It's never clear. <laughs> but he shows up and he says to El Miore, who is the ninth, first ninth dimensional Christ first spirit, ninth. of course. Yep, yeah, got it. He's like, hey, love your work on Venus, but it's a little too perfect. So I'm gonna blow up the planet. Yes. Huh. Like, yeah, you, you guys are great. So uh, I'm going to kill you. Is that all right? Everyone good with that? Cool. Bang. Dead. Where are they going to go, though? <laughs> well, see, they all go to Earth. And Buddha's like, OK, that's my bad. My bad. You made them the right way. I liked them. But for some reason, I blew up their planet. So to help guide these <laughs> Venusians on their new life in Earth, where you start society from scratch for some reason. <laughs> for uh, no reason at all. Because <laughs> we've, we've already established that the Venusians can travel through space. Yeah. So they've, they, they've conquered space. They can do space travel. They go to Earth and are made to start everything from scratch. Not just like land and then build a <laughs> fake White House and carry on. No, back to the drawing board with you guys. Yeah, back to the very start. But it's not all bad because El Miori is going to get a council of other spirits to help him. <laughs> Great. Oh, this council is incredible. This council is is one of my favorite things in in the, in the film. Do they represent like the other dimensions? Like oh. two through eight? and No, no. But they are really, really fantastic. So now we're going to go and take a look at Earth. And what you need to know about Earth is the reason why El Miore moved everyone to Earth is because souls can evolve on it eternally as opposed to Venus where they can only get up to like Charmander, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they even say, so because of that, because you can evolve eternally, he said, therefore, higher goals were set for the people of Earth. So, well, hang on, higher goals than create a utopian society. I mean, I think you've already, you've hit the, 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 the bars quite high to begin with. You've nailed that really. So they reinvent White House and togas and nail it on Earth now? No, no. You not, see, not immediately. Not immediately. El Miore, he changes his name to El Cantare. It's never clear why, but again, <laughs> it's not at all I, why. I feel like there was something with like an underage girl or boy. He doesn't want to talk about it. It's, it's the only reason I know that people change their names. And he makes all the animals as well. And what I like is he makes them in height order, which is an interesting way of going about uh, creating, populating the planet. Start with the small stuff, make them sequentially larger and get them to line up as you do so. Mm -hmm. We see dolphins. What? We see a whale. And because this is a Japanese film, I really badly wanted someone to like, pop up and start hunting the whale and having like a, a whaling <laughs> draw like, sort of come in. <laughs> okay, so all the animals literally line up by height and then they're just like... All right, got it. Everybody dispersed and they're <laughs> yeah, like, what happened? Pretty much. It's kind of like an opening credit sequence while El Cantare creates all the animals. <laughs> but then he gives the humans gender. And hey, credit where credit's due. I like how Happy Science Cult has divided up the men and the women here. He gave the men <laughs> wisdom and the ladies grace and compassion. Lovely. Yeah. And then they just chill for a bit. The humans chill on Earth for a bit, but when the Earth's population reached 770 million, that is when El Cantare, who used to be El Miore, who was obviously created by Buddha to re 
teach these Venusians how to evolve their souls eternally, he's allowed to put together a super team of alien spirits. Yes. Oh, they're so good. It's the other ninth dimensional spirits. So the thing is, he gets this team, but it, there's eight of them in the team. And it's not like you get all eight at once. But there's not enough of a gap between getting the first three and then the rest of them for it to even seem meaningful. So you get the first three, you get beamed down, and you've got uh, Jesus, who's known as Amor, no idea why, Therabim slash Confucius, and Moria slash Moses. And I thought, well, that's a bit harsh on Muhammad, but then I don't <laughs> think happy science. I suspect instead of Confucius, they originally had Muhammad, and I think the animators vetoed that. I thought, mm, can we can we be use someone else? Is that These all right? offices are so nice. So yeah, those are the first three. But then, you know how sometimes you're making a planet for the Venusians to internally evolve their souls, and then you yeah. accidentally make Been there. overly aggressive dinosaurs? Too many aggressive dinosaurs. Yep. Exactly. So they what had they to do about that. They got some warriors from the Magellic Cloud. Yeah. Ooh. El Cantare beamed all of, all of these other aliens to Earth to go around hunting those dinosaurs and, and sorting things out. And if you're wondering how did they hunt the dinosaurs? I was. Just picture in your mind, this is obviously billions of years ago or I don't know, so however many years, millions of years ago. So obviously these warrior aliens were floating around on hoverboards shooting them with lasers. That's how they <laughs> sorted the dinosaurs out. Yeah. Oh, I was picturing like Wile E. Coyote traps for, for the dinosaurs. Ooh, yeah. Would have been more fun. <laughs> but of course, you know what it's like. If you give a Magellic Cloud alien a cookie, they're gonna massacre people. So... They got some <laughs> pussies from Orion to balance them out, along with three new grand spirits, Manu, Matrior, and Isaac Newton. <laughs> Sorry, Isaac Newton, the mathematician? Mm -hmm. yeah, Manu, yeah, Matrior, Isaac Newton. Okay. So then they got another set of immigrants. They don't actually say why, but they're from Pegasus, and they came with two other grand spirits. These are the last two, Zeus and Zoroaster. And at this point, I don't know about you guys, but I really want to be at those grand spirit meetings. All right, everyone. I call to order this meeting of the high spirits of El Cantare. Mm -hmm. Now, as you all know, the humans have recently discovered nuclear technology. Obviously, this is a great benefit but also a great risk. I, I'm, I'm, so, I'm terribly sorry. A, a, a um, quick question. Uh, yes, Isaac Newton, question. Right, right. Um, is there any chance we might solve this one with biblical numerology? Oh, <sighs> again. What? I've, I've worked really hard on it. Oh, we know you did, Isaac, but we've had this conversation. Oh, that's easy for you to say, Confucius, but... I wish I'd been born 2,000 years earlier so I could just flap my gums about common sense and be a high spirit. Okay, come on now. Uncalled that's, for. That's uncalled for. No, no, this always happens. This always happens. We call a meeting of the high spirits and everyone listens to Lemoo and can't get enough of Cracker Jack or whatever. But whenever I come up with an idea, everybody looks at me like I'm the weird. Fine, fine, fine. Isaac, what do you think we should do about Earth's recent discovery of atomic power? Have we tried... Not having sex. Okay, never mind. Every time with this guy. Get out. Fine, but don't come crying to me when you're all sticky with sex juice. Okay. Every time. So now we cut over to the Spirit <laughs> Council, and they're sort of, I'm going to say, summing up Earth's population for us. Yeah, and, and the thing about the Spirit Council is, they're only ever columns of colored light with kind of a vague, fuzzy, person-shaped blob in the background. And I kept thinking I'd develop cataracts or something because it, <laughs> you'd only just... Like, when you're going to put Jesus in the film, you'd think, right, we're going to get a classic animated Jesus in there. We'll have the beard, we'll have the long hair. But no, he's just like this sort of grayish silver blob in a sort of Star Trek-esque, beam me up Scotty like light kind of stream. That's what they all are. And they're all a different color. This film was very impressed with how many colors it could name. That It was very <laughs> proud to show that off. <laughs> what year is it right now? How many million, billion years ago? Oh, who the fuck knows? It's older than 120 million years ago. I think it's close to about 400 million years ago. There we go. Okay. okay. So the population, this, what the spirits are talking about is that the population is now more than 40 billion, but immigrants, the ones from Pegasus and the Magellan Cloud and Orion, 
they're less than 10% of the population. What point is that making? What point? Because the, <laughs> they said, but the, but the immigrants are only less than 10%. So, well, are you are you expecting the immigrants to be a higher percent? Are you aiming for a high percentage? <laughs> what what are you, are you worried that if you don't have as, as much immigrant labor than some of the more menial jobs that the 40 billion members of the your, your current uh, earth won't want to do, they won't get done? Like, what was it trying <laughs> to say here? It was so strange. All right, guys, we need to build some slats around the atmosphere or something. <laughs> this is getting ridiculous. They, they needed like a diversity initiative. It was very unclear. But what do you do when you don't have enough immigrants? <laughs> That's right. You build a Pytron to um, clone the spirits of the immigrants. What? Well, yeah. So this is this is the thing. He says, we don't have enough immigrants. So the way to do it is we need to get the immigrants to multiply on Earth. But then they're not immigrants. They're <laughs> earthly. If they're born on Earth, they're not immigrants anymore. Yeah. Got to get rid of that law. It doesn't, it doesn't count if you sneak in and do the boring thing. No, 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 no. We're not doing that anymore. Anchor What's a Pytron, by the way? Oh, it's a giant tall tower that mm. shoots a beam of light at an immigrant and then it turns into five immigrants instead of just one. Oh, yeah, man. Yeah, and it's filled with loads of dudes sort of stood around in blue jumpsuits for no really clear reason. Yeah. Just, not really evidently obvious. Just watching. Okay. <laughs> Wow, this is a nightmare for some American people right now after watching this. Well, I'm glad you pointed that out because you see the clones, <laughs> and I think we've all run into this problem, the clones aren't spiritual. So they all fuck each other and did heroin. You hate to see it. Heroin? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. But it, not, not your current heroin because this is still about 300 million years ago. So it's kind of, it's, it's proto-heroin. Yeah, space heroin. Why invent proto-heroin? <laughs> it's just it's like a weird set of things, this... This god is putting <laughs> together. Okay. Yeah. It's just work around after work around. There's such good voiceover work going on in the backgrounds when they're taking heroin. Because it's got all the all the, the sort of evil immigrant clones uh, sort of t telling each other the dry drugs and stuff. And they're saying like, nobody's going to find out. And everybody's doing it. And it is like straight out of like a 1980s school, just say no PSA. It's it's that level of kind of direct, straight down the line uh, sort of voiceover. It's incredible. I don't like the taste of heroin. That's my, that's my out. <laughs> Yeah, so we get a little uh, shot of the sinful world of the immigrant clones for a while here. They all live in like Tim Burton's Batman Vania or something. Yeah, I have other uh, in SpongeBob's neighborhood. Uh, it's, yep. it's got that kind of waviness <laughs> to it. <laughs> uh, but they're all fucking each other. In fact, they fuck each other and do so much heroin and so much killing that they all eventually their spirits break into pieces and go to a lower dimension than the one they're in. I'm not sure which one they're in. And that dimension turns into hell because all their bad deeds and sadness turns into clouds that not even the light of Buddha can penetrate. Wow. Okay, that escalated quickly. God was like, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invent proto-heroin. I feel like this is going to go well. And they're all doing it. Fuck. And there's hell now. They made a whole dimension hell. What the fuck? All right. So because we've got hell, obviously we need someone to kind of rule all of that. So, and specifically 120 million years ago, very specifically on that <laughs> date, one of the angry space elves who are, I guess the kind of space Muslims, I think that's who the, the sort of the warrior tribe who was supposed to be killing all those dinosaurs, they came off, they were very coded as, as uh, sort of historically Persian. So yeah. one of those uh. angry space elves was reborn on earth, it said, he was already on Earth and alive, and then they just said he was reborn on Earth as Satan. So we've got this kind of Arabic Satan kind of guy going on. And so he started kind of having a big palace, getting himself loads of concubines and stuff. And whenever you're going to do that, you don't install a skylight because then you're going to you're going to invite invisible golden fairies to come and try and kill you with laser beams. And that is, in fact, what happens. Okay. Invisible golden fairies come down and attack him with laser beams, which in turn makes him kill all of his friends and family because that's where the invisible golden fairies with laser beams are. Because mm -hmm. of the skylight. I did exactly. not see that coming. I didn't. <laughs> no. Okay. Yeah, we wouldn't have a, a Satan if he'd have just gone for just a, a, a solid roof. Window. <laughs> put a window in. They probably had windows then. You had spaceships. You can do windows. Yeah, but then he gets killed and goes to hell. Well, he gets hit with it by the sword of a sort of a blonde bearded fairy god wearing gold who just sort of hit him with the sword and that makes Satan fall really, really slowly into hell. Mm -hmm. Not sure. But when he was in hell, we do know he was pretty pissed off about that. And that's why he grew tiny little bat wings and yep. lifted up a rock. Teeny tiny bat wings, lifts up a rock. 
And we also learned here, and this is very important to me. <laughs> the fuck is happening? <laughs> he, after he's damned down to hell, he becomes the king of hell? Yeah. Which I feel like is a weird election, right? And is it like, who's the most pissed off to be here? <laughs> <laughs> so now we cut back to the spirit council. And uh, let me tell you, this hell shit is a real thorn in their side. <laughs> yeah, uh, Isaac Newton is very clearly worried about how hell is going to affect the world. 120 million years ago. <laughs> yeah, and and he's right because over the next 120 million years the world got worse and worse. Plus, if you die inhabited by a demon, you become one. Yeah, and then uh, then in order to try and sort of uh inhabit other people, you end up sort of floating up to the surface, sort of like a bad smell, and you sort of sneak between cracks <laughs> in the pavement like a bad smell, and yeah. then uh, people inhale you and then they're sort of like, "Oh, that smells like a that's a hell demon, isn't it?" And then they <laughs> die as well and go to hell. Yeah, there's sort of a fern gully vibe to it. We we tried to make an anti hell mask order, and everybody's like, <laughs> "Fuck you!" <laughs> but the thing is, I do so what I want. Every spirit in hell has to recruit more spirits to hell in order for hell to work. And all I'm saying is, if you're going to start a cult, right, and you don't want to seem like a con artist, try to avoid your foundational mythology repeatedly resembling a pyramid scheme. He does yep. this time and again in his story. <laughs> it is um... it's like it's definitely a hell pyramid scheme. It's tough. So the 24 spirits are like, ah, fuck, cloning machine, bad idea. So they <laughs> kill everyone and start over. Yeah, kill everyone and start over. Yeah, and so the, the way they do that, we see the Earth from space and we see all of hell concentrate on what looks to be Australia. And I thought, <laughs> can you imagine anybody stupid enough to think you can just take all of your evil and undesirable people and send them to Australia? You'd have to be ridiculous <laughs> to think that was a good idea. Just start a lake of fire there? That's never going to happen. Come on. <laughs> and then uh, mankind it got all swamped by hell so that the powers that be decided, yeah, you make Earth completely uninhabitable for all in a move that's subsequently been taken up by pretty much all conservative governments. So it's nice <laughs> that we've got a free line. <laughs> Yeah, so with our second chance at civilization destroyed, El Cantari is hoping three's the charm and they start <laughs> again. But this thing is that was the second one, but it said so that's a another civilization's been destroyed. And I was like, well, are you are you counting Venus because the people came from Venus? Or or was the dinosaurs also a civilization? Are you are you counting those in there? I got very, very confused by well, one of the things that confused me most about the voiceover is that they kept changing who was doing the voiceover. They kept sort of like tagging in a different voiceover artist midway through. That was throwing me enough. <laughs> and then when they started talking about civilizations, I was I was completely lost. Yeah, I am picturing dinosaurs in adorable togas right now, though. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the reason they did that is they just hired American voice actors until that voice actor was like, what the fuck is this script? And then they were like, all right, you're fired. Bring in the next guy. Bring in the next guy. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, he's going to try again. But this time to make sure that everyone doesn't turn evil, he's going to spend branches of his spirit to be guiding spirits of light. Oh, yeah. Oh, this is good. Because the way they talk about that as well is about how he needs to sort of purify the world, which is already a kind of an awkward phrase to be using. And it gives you a kind of, you know, yeah. why do you make me hurt Phrasing. you like this kind of vibe from the spirits. <laughs> but when they're talking about how they've had to purify the world by killing everyone, they literally say, direct quote, there's got to be a better way. <laughs> there's got to be a better way. <laughs> Satan trying to open a carton of milk. He just walks out carrying 13 dimensions. They fall all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> so then we get one last view of hell. They now have clown mechs. Marsh, do you remember this? The like weird clown robots? Yeah, that was that was strange. Satan's got particularly large as well. Satan's really worked up, but that's because it seems like there is a constant stream of golden angel fairies popping up to hit him with swords. So that's true. He wants, he's been it's a good workout. He, he keeps that going. <laughs> For a hundred million years. <laughs> Once you've got one golden angel fairy, you know you've got a thousand. It's terrible. You gotta, <laughs> you gotta throw out all your cereal. It's the fucking worst. <laughs> Just a nest of golden fairies. You open up a cupboard, they're all loud in the background. <laughs> sort of startled by the lights. It's a big uh, tent over the entire dimension. <laughs> Ugh, we gotta... Set the bomb. We got to leave for a week. Worse. Oh, Can I just get some get a motel? Golden fairy traps at the hardware store. <laughs> <laughs> but don't worry, because seventeen thousand years ago, El Cantare's light descended on the continent of Moo. 
And this, oh, this doesn't make sense because they say this project was planned 17,000 years ago. But is it 17? Because was it 80 billion years ago or was it 120 million years ago? Like at what point do you consider this the start of the project? Because <laughs> you, you were all, everything was getting to this point. But no, 17. <laughs> what happened in the 120 million years between 120 million years ago, which we were just on with Satan and 17,000 years ago? These are all just big numbers, Marsh. You're, you're, you're being you're being ridiculous. In the words of the happy science cult, you're overthinking it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, if I understand this all correctly, uh, I probably don't. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you guys probably don't know. But it seems like the great spirit is going to give civilization a third chance mm -hmm. on, I believe you described it as a non-existent continent named Mu. Continent of Mu. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to need a quick break to do a tremendous amount of acid. <laughs> and when I'm tripping hard enough, we'll be back for even more The Laws of the Sun. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the first presidential debate of hell. I'm Matt Lauer. Um, yeah, I'm not, not sure what I was expecting, but I guess it's good to be back at work. Tonight, two titans of torment vie for control of the underworld. We have Satan, Prince of Darkness, who fell from heaven just over 6,000 years ago after his battle against God. And, of course, we have President Donald Trump, who choked on a Big Mac last week. Gentlemen, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me, Matt. Demon, fire, camera, demon. Nailed it. All right. So tonight's questions are all submitted by residents. Mr. Trump, you're up first. Stacy in the doom hole asks, Dear God, stop the burning, make the burning stop. Oh, well, Tracy. Let me just say that the burning we do here, it's the best in the world, the best in the universe. It's a clean burn. Not a lot of people know that, but it's clean. And I think you're going to be really, really happy with the burning in the future. Oh, you're done. Okay, great. Uh, Satan, your response? What? That was nonsense. Look, you're going to be really, ha really happy with the burning? Of course you won't. It, it's hell. You're, you're not supposed to be happy here. Boo! Boo! All yeah. right. I see. Next up, a question for Satan. Lots of people feel that an ontological outsider could really mix things up. Why should the people of hell stick with you as their leader? Honestly, does anybody think we need an outsider here? Like, What possible good could less expertise and less experience do? Not only do I reject the premise, it's based on a stupid mythos in the first place. Boo, boo, nerd, oh, boo, nerd, seriously? Boo, nerd, boo, nerd. Yes, well... The screams of the undying are in, and yep, by a small margin, Donald Trump is the new king of hell. It's official. <sighs> I can't believe this. Wow, what an honor. Let me say, I look forward to being the masthead of the worst possible place, filled with the most possible suffering for the second time. How did I lose this? Oh, electoral college. There's an electoral college in hell. There's nothing but an electoral college in hell. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it tracks. I'm Matt Lauer. <laughs> <laughs> You're tangling it. I, I it's am all tangled. not. I'm bunching it so I can release it. That's slowly. tangling. Hey, it's hey, tangled. Hey, hey, guys, guys, what's with the yelling? Oh, hey, Eli. Uh, Heath and I are just setting up our new cell phone plan. That is two cans and a string that you have there. And, and a very affordable string we have a good that. Guys, string guy. guys, if you want to switch cell phone plans, why don't you just try Mint Mobile? What's Mint Mobile? They're the first company to sell premium wireless service online only. Mint Mobile lets you maximize your savings with plans starting at just $15 a month. After we'd done a couple of ads for them, I actually made the switch, and I've saved hundreds of dollars on my cell phone bill a month. Wait, hundreds? Hundreds. Wait, how, how is that possible? Is this the dark web again? No, nope, not again. By going online only and eliminating the traditional costs of retail, Mint Mobile passes significant savings on to you. All plans come with unlimited talk and text, plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. You can use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone number along with all your existing contacts. And if you're not 100% satisfied, Mint Mobile has you covered with their 7-day money-back guarantee. Okay, that sounds amazing. So how do we sign up? Well, to get your new wireless plan for just $15 a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash gam. That's mintmobile.com slash gam. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash gam. All right. Hey, give me just a second while I tell Heath. 
Hey Heath, did you hear about Mint Mobile? Heath, Heath, you got you, you have to listen inside of the the can. I know, I'm busy. I'm busy right now. Doing what? Yeah, man, doing what? See, it's Heath stuff. You don't know. I have stuff. Okay. Just pick up the can. <laughs> <laughs> and we're back. So far, I'd say it's a pretty straightforward story of Venusian immigrants cloning themselves and accidentally making hell despite the help of the great spirit, Isaac Newton. Um, question, though. Did anything happen on entirely fake continents? It sounded like that might happen. <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, it did, he. And I should point out that that is what the rest of the movie will be. El Cantare reincarnating as a dude with awesome pecs. And the yeah. first one okay. will be a guy named Lamu from the continent of Mu. Yes. <laughs> and didn't didn't they make didn't he make them call the continent after his name? Yeah. That was well, the, the, no, they volunteered. They volunteered. They liked him <laughs> so much they named the whole continent after him. <laughs> I love that their fake continent means kind of the nothing, <laughs> which is appropriate. And Mu appeared 370,000 years ago uh, where Indonesia is now, which is a fucking wild thing to say. So that, that's that's so weird. So first of all, yeah, it appeared 370,000 years ago. And at this point, I'm drawing like a timeline on the wall. I'm using red string to keep track of what events happened <laughs> when because they're just throwing dates at me. But they say, yeah, Mu is twice the size of Australia and located roughly where Indonesia is. And I wrote like, guys, I think you're thinking of Australia. Exactly. <laughs> it's about Australia, the same size yeah. of Australia and roughly where Indonesia is. That, that's Australia you're talking about. <laughs> no, no, because they had a bunch of spiders and everyone, everyone was like three clicks more attractive than America. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't understand. You wouldn't understand. Um. <laughs> All right, I, well, I created that proto heroin. I'm doing drop bears too. I feel like they, I, I come up with good things. This will be good. Oh, and it's great as well because they say on Mu, twenty thousand years ago, the first signs of civilization appeared. It's like yeah, but that's around about two hundred million years or so behind the rest of the planet, which, to be <laughs> fair, is more up to date than current Australian culture is. So they were actually <laughs> better than, uh, than Australia. Shots fired. <laughs> but as we see, uh, Mu is actually doing pretty well. They have laser pyramids. They have got laser pyramids, yeah, yeah. Okay, I was I was hoping for something like that. Specifically, the, the laser pyramids are to zap the other laser pyramids with sunbeams in order to make water happen mechanically. Yeah. What? Yeah, it's never quite explained, but the narrator does let us know that civilization reached its peak again <laughs> with the laser pyramids. You know, they're putting fluoride in those lasers. It's uh, <laughs> It's no good. So, so we cut over to Lamu, and Lamu, by the way, is the first of many incarnations of El Cantare, who is delicious looking. I mean, he, <laughs> mm, put your fist in my mouth, Lamu. That's all I'm going to say. What's that? Put your fist in my mouth? Can Lamu. We circle back? That's that's it. Put your fist in my mouth, <laughs> Lamu. That's my, my, my official statement on it. Uh, is, but he's just what Eli's into. Yeah, he's praying. M mouth fisting. <laughs> yes. Oh, that, that's a positive sexual thing to you. Yeah, as I opposed to, to what? Clear. A negative eating thing? <laughs> Pay attention. He unless, it, <laughs> unless it was like a kind of bite down on this kind of thing. Ooh, like it, wasn't, right. it was neither positive nor negative, but it was a coping mechanism. Like a the Civil rest War of like doctor. The good hurts. <laughs> yeah. But he's praying and he's, he's going through sort of a doodly do slash montage of everyone in his society being dicks. Yeah, yeah. And there's one guy who he says, why don't you pray with me? And the guy says, this is the age of advanced solar technology. Who needs silly prayer? And I thought, yes, mate. In any reasonable world, you would be the hero of this film. You've got all this technology. <laughs> you do not need prayer. You are right that it is silly. But yeah, we, we do a sort of a montage of a guy getting fired. And then there's a woman who, okay, Marsh, help me out on this. The mom who's holding her son, the kid's supposed to be sick, right? That's what the movie is. It, like trying to indicate to us. I can't tell if he's supposed to be sick or if he's like selfish and she's sort of despairing <laughs> for his his soul. I'm not sure. It's it is very unclear. There's never like usually when you show the sick kid, there's a moment where the doctor comes and shakes his head. But what we will watch in this montage is this mom holding this little boy and she just looks disappointed to have a kid at all. Yeah, yeah, because the thing is, if the kid was sick, <laughs> the next scene we see is people in a hospital and the kid isn't there. So 
it's not sickness because we they've, they've got hospitals they've got ways well they've got places where people where whinging women lie around complaining about not having access to water and how shit the facilities are but they sell that as a hospital yeah they have very very strange standards for the hospital here we show this scene inside the hospital and everyone's like fix my rash where's the doctor i want a bath every day <laughs> <laughs> Literal quotes. So yeah, we see the hospital that's going to get one star on Yelp. <laughs> what are what are we watching right now? This is a civilization that's part of the history in a positive way. Ah! Yeah, it's kind of Egyptian ish. I would say is kind of how they're they're framing it. Yeah, Egyptian y. But Lamu is disappointed, so uh, he gathers everyone around to hear himself speak on his birthday. Yeah. I mean- <laughs> And we've got like a whole procession of people <laughs> going there with some fruit. You've got like a guy who who falls down and everyone in the march, obviously at the point where th- th- somebody like pushes him down, uh, knocks the old guy over. Obviously everybody in the march resigns in solidarity with the person who pushed the old guy down because that's what happens in civil- <laughs> civilized societies. You side with the person who's pushing old people. Yep. And so, so Lamu comes out and gives a speech. And here's how I would describe the speech. Marsh, I'm very interested in your take on it. Imagine you were asked to give an inspiring speech to an entire continent, but you had prepared nothing and had nothing to say. That's what this speech is. Yes, but in his defense, whenever he steps into the sun, he starts sparkling like he's a twilight vampire. And uh, at that point, you don't need speeches because everyone's going to be like, oh yeah, I can see you're pretty, you're pretty good. So the speech that he gives, and actually like, this probably says more about you than anything else, in that situation where you've got lots of people listening and you haven't prepared anything and you think this is kind of him kind of vamping, he starts by saying, I am a god. And that's <laughs> that's where you'd go with that. It's like, well, I've not got anything written down, so uh, I guess I'm announcing my deity. Look, just saying I'm never getting attacked by a giant marshmallow man because of it. <laughs> so yeah, he starts this speech and, and as Marsh mentioned, as he's saying these sort of somewhat truisms but also bizarre piece of advice so he'll be like don't be selfish give to your fellow man quote learn something every second yeah do do not ever end a second without learning something which (laughs) is psychopathic advice Ah, (laughs) constantly looking at the encyclopedia Uh, also he says that the preceding (laughs) sentence he says god will love you without asking anything of you in return and all he asks in return is that you constantly strive for spiritual improvement (laughs) and learn something every second of the day yeah we won't ask for anything except homework on a second by second (laughs) basis okay yeah, and he also mentions that uh, please ignore that I appear to be shedding glitter. Just, <laughs> just ignore it. It's a special kind of dandruff. Ooh, glitter. No, I, I have a cream. I have a cream. Oh, what do you want to take a time out and put it on? Because I'm <laughs> really not listening to anything you're saying. It's a lot of glitter. But yeah, L- Lamu sort of gives this big speech, and then we praise him a little bit. Oh, and this is where he tells him not only is he God, he's also the Son. Yep. And people go, like, oh, wow, he's the sun. And I, at this point, I really want him to actually be the sun. And so for all of the millions of people in front of him to be like hurtling towards him <laughs> during, due to his gravitational pull and like burning up on uh, as they approach him. <laughs> oh, fuck, should have been something smaller. There's a, uh... <laughs> all right, fourth time's a charm, but no. So now we cut over to Lamu and this is very important. This is where the movie lets a little bit of its agenda show. It's like Lamu was a great ruler who always checked with God whenever he made national policy. and we see everyone who was going through shitty stuff before praying at their special lamu shrines which which he swings a giant golden ring into and then they glow yes yeah yeah everyone's everyone's got their own pyramids in their room and the, and the the pyramid starts lighting up whenever they pray which is more tangible proof than any religion has ever managed subsequently and it's 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 not that much more impressive than a light bulb at best and that's still more than any religion has achieved is basic prayer based light bulbs also and you know that's going to be a drag right you get up in the middle of the night for a piss and you're like oh fuck um oh lamu you're so great i just gotta get this piss what it went off <laughs> fucking motion detect pray light bulbs and things how Lemu sends that kind of zap out is he he basically looks like he explodes and 
this is not the first time, this might be the first time, it's not the only time in the film that he explodes in what looks to be a mushroom cloud in the middle of a city, <laughs> which is a weird Ooh. visual to give as a Japanese cult that is pro-nuclear weapons. Yeah. This seems to be part of their agenda. <laughs> <sighs> so after the death of Lamu the Great, yep. everyone turns into dicks again. And Heath, now, based on what you've learned so far, any guesses what they do when they turn no. into dicks? <laughs> Uh, proto heroin. That is correct. The answer is proto heroin. <laughs> is <it>? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but El Cantare is not something. doing the whole restart the planet thing. So Lamu disappears beneath the ocean. And that's why there's no evidence it ever existed. Yep. <laughs> What's lovely is the way they explain it is they say their bad deeds made the continent sink in three stages. Oh, the continent. Fell into the ocean. See, that's why you don't name yourself as a god the same as the continent. <laughs> yeah, I didn't confusing. understand what happened. Yeah. Okay. Now, the, the whole continent sank in three stages. Then they move on. They don't tell you those three stages. I don't know why they bothered pointing out it fell in three separate <laughs> stages, but they're not going to tell you what they are. Move on. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and don't worry, everyone on Lamu doesn't die. People escape on boats. And that's where Japanese, Chinese, and Vietnamese people come from. That This, this annoyed me a bit. <laughs> Because they said what? some of the people from Mu were able to escape on boats and they became Japanese, Chinese and Vietnamese. But other people sailed eastward. So hang on. So the other people also escaped on boats. So it's not <laughs> some of them escaped on boats. The people of Mu escaped on boats and some of them went to, to become Japanese, and Chinese and Vietnamese is what you're trying to say. It was so confusing. Okay. So they were in Indonesia. The yes. ones that went eastward became like Africa? No, no. So think a bit more north than that. Uh, and close. Think fictional. Oh. <laughs> Were you guessing Atlantis? Because Atlantis? they go to Atlantis. Oh, yes, it is they Atlantis. Do. Okay. Yeah. They went east to Atlantis from Indonesia. Got it. And to be fair, some of them didn't arrive in boats. Some of them did arrive in airplanes that Atlantis had 12,000 years ago. They just had planes then. So that's, that's how they got to <laughs> the fictional continent of Atlantis from the other fictional continent of Mu on their... They're airplanes. They're yeah. twelve thousand year old airplanes. Yeah. <laughs> and there on Atlantis, <laughs> so mad. Al Cantare reincarnated again for the second time as Thoth. Mm. Thoth the omniscient and omnipotent who knew about some stuff. <laughs> Yep, yep. It says, Thoth was omniscient and he had great knowledge in a number of fields. <laughs> Not all of okay. the fields, then. Not all of the fields. <laughs> Is the number infinity? Because that's a weird way to say it. <laughs> and, and the direct quote about what fields, it says a number of fields ranging from religion, politics, philosophy, science, and art. That's the end of that sentence. That's not how ranging anything? works. It doesn't range to something? Okay. <laughs> a range. didn't invent ranging yet. A rangeable <laughs> list. <laughs> so yeah, the Atlanteans, obviously, and look, this is old news. I don't need to tell anybody, but the Atlanteans... They immigrate from there to Egypt, to Rome and Greece. That's where Western civilization comes from. Then Thoth dies. And now it's time for Rient Al Crowd. <laughs> and don't worry if I pronounce that wrong, because one, that guy's not real. And two, this movie will pronounce his name at least four different ways. <laughs> okay. Is this another lower level god? This is El Cantare reincarnating himself again. Yeah. Oh, he, okay. He he became Lamu, and now he's becoming Rian Kulkuron. Well, Heath, if you paid attention, uh, <laughs> first he was uh, El Cantare. Then, well, uh, he became... actually, before that, he was El Miore. But that's right. that's, that's that's what we like. The, the, the long term <laughs> fans of El Cantare know him as. I mean, yeah. some, some of the more kind of uh, Johnny Come Latelys don't know about the early stuff. But uh, if you were there from the start, man, you'd you'd get it. You'd get it. I, I saw El Miore <laughs> play in a garage with six high spirits. Isaac Newton was there. Moses. <laughs> Jesus is the best. Confucius is there. <laughs> but no, Rianto Cloud is the reincarnation that takes place in the ancient Incan peoples. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, everywhere. Of Atlantis. Every, no, this is after Atlantis. Has Atlantis sank? Atlantis has sank by now again, hasn't it? I the assume same thing so. happened. Atlantis. It, probably sinks. in three stages. Yeah. No, okay, no. I ahead. remember very vividly, actually. Uh, Atlantis sinks and they don't tell you how many stages it sank in. So it, <laughs> what? We'll never know. I need know. to know you, these things. That's ridiculous. I have no idea what that looks like. Well, we will never whatever. know. Bad movie. When you're watching it, it, it is much easier to tell who is the reincarnation of Alcantara because 
in every different version of himself, he is constantly dripping in gold jewellery. This guy <laughs> wore a lot of gold clothing. He had a look. That look <laughs> survived multiple centuries, multiple different incarnations of himself. Just look for the guy dressed in as bling as possible. And that's that's your, okay. uh, your humble god. Late Elvis, humble god. Oh, got but him. his pecs are sh Every incarnation of him, and this is very important because it's for the best surprise at the very, very end of the movie. Every incarnation of El Cantare is like super ripped with a 27 pack and a chiseled jaw. Just just keep that in mind as we go through these incarnations. I promise it'll pay off at the end. Uh, but yeah, All right. we're in ancient. Put your fist in my mouth. Yep, exactly. So we're in ancient Inca. <laughs> Everyone's doing a feather mask dance like you do. Sure. And then the announcer guy who sounds like your impersonation of me or a mean impersonation of Jews, depending on how you want to interpret it. <laughs> okay. Yep. That's what I, that, that, uh, my impersonation of you is like, burk, 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 burk. <laughs> it's just noises. It's not. All right. Yeah. Jews. Whatever. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he announces that there's going to be a human sacrifice to God that night. Oh, okay. Yeah. What is that going to accomplish? Well, I'll tell you. So we cut over to Jew voice guy visiting God. Yeah, this is this is this is. You tell it, Eli, because I'm not going to be able to get this out. <laughs> this is this is my favorite part of the movie because it's where mm -hmm. the movie is like <laughs> we haven't even talked about this shit, but we are now. So offensive Jewish voice guy, he goes to see God. God's like, yes, I want to sacrifice, and then he leaves, and God pulls off his face. Because he's a reptilian. Well, not, he's not a reptilian. He's a reptilian. The, oh. the, the, the race of aliens who are reptiles are the reptilian. And at this point, for a film, <laughs> for, a, for a, a legacy that has been pretty imaginative so far, it's kind of let themselves down by just going with the reptilians <laughs> as the evil reptiles with red eyes that want to eat people um, and invade Earth. The reptilians. Okay, and God is one of them. God is one of these reptile. The evil mask god off. is the evil Incan god, not not our god, not the dripping kind of beautiful oh, uh, Eli's Eli's questioning the 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 validity of his marriage by this point level of god. That's El Cantare. Yeah. Oh, the and we'll keep it. The evil races that sailed in a different direction. Yeah, they came down. The god of so them. So we do see some Inca drawings of their of this evil race sort of descending down into the, that area on a, a flying boat. But when you do see those drawings, I was confused because they look so clearly like minions that I was completely lost on this. I just thought that they were just drawing minions <laughs> from Despicable Me. <laughs> um, and we learn here that the reptilians want to eat humans, but that's against the law. So what they do is they make the humans act like dicks. And if the humans act like dicks, they're allowed to eat them so that, quote, <laughs> they could control the planet before the space police interfered. Stop mm -hmm. resisting. <laughs> and exact now. real unexplained quote. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Space police are here. Okay, <laughs> they worked it in. And so they have this kind of thing going on where they're like, they want to invade Earth, but doing that would be a violation of the prime directive because the uh, because Earth is uh, is peaceful. <laughs> so they don't, they don't do that. But instead what they do is just brainwash people to be evil. But like, that kind of still feels like you're interfering with Earth at that point. It doesn't feel like that's that's not interrupting. It doesn't feel, I don't think you're circumnavigating the rules by saying we're not allowed to interfere. All we're allowed to do is brainwash people to be evil. Oh yeah, and occasionally eat people from Earth. But other than that, no interfering. Other than that, it's completely hands off, guys. Yeah. Oh yeah. This is stop resisting the God policy for sure. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So we see some characters who we met like, 45 seconds ago and the the evil space alien guards they come to take the daughter for a sacrifice to the reptilians but just as they're about to sacrifice the daughter who shows up rient al crowd he's the god number three yep god's third name okay great and so he he shows up just as literally as the axe is lifted and is about to come down he shows up but he shows up really far away and I think they had plenty of time to drop that axe before they even noticed him there. <laughs> but I just want him to be like a minute late and be like, oh man, I knew I shouldn't have put all this gold jewelry on. It's like the clasps took me way too long to fasten and I could have been here earlier. <laughs> oh, that's, that's on me. That is definitely on me, that one. And there's this great moment where Riental crowd explains that they're reptilians or sorry, reptilians, not <laughs> actually God. And what's great is Jew voice guy is like, what are you talking about? They have 
flying ships because we see that the reptilians have flying ships. He's like, how are they not God? They have flying ships. And he's like, uh, just because you can fly doesn't mean you're God. And then <laughs> to prove that he releases a single balloon. Yes, he does. <laughs> I'm confused by this. Uh, and there's another point where the, the guy you call in Jew, the, the, the Jew fella, he says like, oh, I don't believe you. Show me the proof. And Riental Crude says, I can see the past, the present and the future. He's like, well, that's good enough for me. I mean, that, okay. that counts yeah, as proof. Okay. And then, All right, here's a balloon animal. Now do you believe I'm God? <laughs> he, he doubles down, though. He goes, plus, plus, which is always weird when your God says plus, plus, <laughs> I can exist beyond time and space as a bonus. Okay. <laughs> and I, literally everyone in the crowd is like, okay, we're still, All right. we're still sold. <laughs> yeah. We have four dimensions here. You said like 13. Could you describe the other ones besides <laughs> time and space? No. Do you have any balloons? Ooh, balloons. Okay. Okay. And this is where he tells them what happened to Atlantis and about how Atlantis turned and they buried all of the faithful people alive in the town square. But to be fair, they didn't make the faithful people say happy holidays. So Christians these days still do have it worse. They are still much worse in terms of persecution. <laughs> yep. And they're evil thoughts made the continent sink in an unspecified amount of stages. <laughs> Again? Wow. And I will say, this is a first for any of the religious movies we've watched. Everyone watching literally is just like, yeah, good enough for me. They take <laughs> off their masks, they throw down their armor, and they're just like, yep, all right, cool, I'm on your side now, Riental Crowd. <laughs> but not before Riental Crowd. I think it's around about the same time that uh, Riental Crowd starts doing his sparkly thing, doing his sort of Twilight Vampire sparkly thing. Yeah. And doing the YMCA. Yes! I was going to say he does... What now? He does a celebratory YMCA gesture, which sends out extra golden sparkles mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and unjuifies <laughs> head bad guy. And now, like, they realize they were running out of reel or something. They speed through two more <laughs> incarnations because fuck those guys. This is literally how it goes. I'm not exaggerating. And then in Greece, there was Ophelles, the fundamental god of Greece, who also had a floating golden stick. Then Hermes, I don't know, fuck Ophelles. Um, <laughs> anyways, they were both cool too. Moving on. Yeah, yeah, it's like Ophelles, it says, who could perform miracles, and that's all we know about him. We don't know what those miracles were. And then there's Hermes, who, as far as I can tell, is the god of miniskirts, because he is. <laughs> he is he, this, this guy knows he's got some pins to die for, and he's not afraid to use them. <laughs> Maybe it's Hermes, like the uh, fashion company. Ooh, <laughs> that explains it. All right. Well, uh, I think I'm going to need another minute to recover from that obvious white erasure that just took place <laughs> in history. So we're going to take a quick break one more time. But first, let me give Act 3 the hard sell. Are Marsh and Eli just making shit up to mess with me? I'm pretty sure they are. Do you think people ever get confused when they visit Lamu in the continent of Lamu? Seems like a who's on first type of situation. <laughs> Will the reptilians ever come back or matter? Find out the answer to these questions and more along with me in the thrilling <laughs> conclusion of The Laws of the Sun. Wait, you're saying flies are better than worms? Flies are way better. What? You're crazy. Ah, oh, shit, shit, shit. It's the space police. Oh, fuck, 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 fuck. Are you holding? Of course I am. We just picked up all those humans on Earth. Oh, fuck you, right? Oh, we are so fucked. Dude, dude, it's okay. Be cool. Be cool. I got this. Hi. Hi. Good evening, officer. Good evening. How are you boys doing tonight? I'm fantastic, officer. Dude, be, be um, cool. Sorry. Sorry. We're fine. Oh, okay. Glad to hear it. Did you happen to notice you blew through a dust cluster back there? Like, what? I, like real bad. I did? No. Yeah. Yeah. Right through... Zycolon Prime, right through. The weather's really nice today, officer. What are you doing? Stop. I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. Anyway, just wanted to make sure. So, um, just a quick question. You guys don't have any humans on board, do you? <laughs> what? Humans? Uh, no, we, I, I, I never touch humans. I hate humans. humans. I hate humans. Okay. Well, you boys have a nice night. Slow down through those clusters, all right? Yeah. <laughs> Will do, officer. Thank you. Wow. Man. Lucky we're albino lizards, am I right? <sighs> Tell me about it. <laughs> and we're back. When we left off, El Cantare was 
trying on vessels like a shopping montage in an 80s makeover movie. <laughs> so, uh, Marsh, Eli, who did he crawl into next? I'm glad you asked, Heath, because the answer is Buddha. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. So this is where Buddhist history sort of crosses into happy science cult history. Well, let's just say that they have a long-haired, ripped pex version of Buddha that I want to put his fist in my mouth. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's very much a long-haired pex white version of Buddha because he <laughs> there's not a lot of people of colour as they move their way around Indonesia and India. I mean, we don't know what the people of Atlantis look like or the people of Mu look like. We do know what the people of India look like and it's, <laughs> it's not this guy. <laughs> but yeah, he's bored and, and they're sort of going with the Siddhartha story here, but they've got their own crazy twists on it. So we watch as he's about to get married and he's bored by the dancers and he's bored by the grape his wife offers him. <laughs> uh, but then we see him under his famous tree. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, Buddha sat under a tree for 40 years. <laughs> so he's under the tree and we're going to go through Buddha's temptations. But again, these are not the machia of the Pali canon. These are the crazy interpretations of Buddha via the happy science cult. So first, he's going to meet Yashona, who is a sexy fire lady who offers to do backflips for him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. who then Dr. Stranges herself into 30 versions of her to surround him, which I thought this is going to do it for him and he's going to be totally into this with all 30 hers. He's just going to have an absolute whale of a time. But he says he's not interested in having sex with her because it will only bring about pain and suffering. And apparently that's not what he's into when it comes to that kind of thing. So, you know, each their own. I like the idea that Buddha's trying to do this original, like, all right, think about nothing for 40 years. I got this. <laughs> a sexy lady shows up doing backflips. He's like, ah, come on. Got really? me. Got me. I, backflips are my thing. Okay. Okay. How many? Six minutes. Fuck. <laughs> all right. Start counting the breaths again. One. Then he negs all the, the satanic ladies. He's like, mm -hmm. uh, so you're the devil, which is why you're all ugly. But, but. There's good in each of you. Make your heart and mind beautiful. And the satanic demon wit ladies back away because Buddha creeped them out. <laughs> <laughs> they do. But they do back away with a lot of kind of lady gasps and lady groans that I had put my earphones in because I didn't want Nicola thinking I was watching porn. It was that. <laughs> that, that, that I mean, what do you want to be caught watching? The laws of the sun or some good old fashioned porn? Hey, Marsh, you got, you got your fist in your mouth? What you doing there? <laughs> No. So now it's time for his next temptation, Siddhartha. And this is Brahma, or as I call him in my notes, Black Santa. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I read through your notes ahead and I, I saw Black Santa and I was just like baffled more than anything else. Okay. <laughs> Very excited. This is Brahma appearing to El Cantare inside of the Buddha. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Black and he's Santa doing Claus. his um, booming Noah voice of kind of how bullshit is it? Is the voice <laughs> that he's doing throughout. <laughs> yeah. He, he looks like if you if like Black Santa was a character in a two player fighter game. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, look, you did a good job resisting those lady devils, but you forgot your father. Don't you remember when you forgot your father? Doodly do. Doodly do. <laughs> I, you doing a doodly -doo? I do. I do like the idea that uh, you got Black Santa as a fighter in a, a two-player fighting game. But I think specifically the character is White Santa. But then when the second player also selects that character, Ooh, you get Black yeah. Santa. Or, <laughs> so you, or you select him and you press low kick, then you get Black Santa. Yeah, no, that's, that, that tracks. Uh, so now we're in Buddha's doodly do. S sorry, what? Ra like, there's some kind of racial supremacy thing going on here mm. with this happy science cult, but are they white supremacists from Japan? I I'm not clear. It's not clear. It's also an anime convention slightly as well. Yeah, it's it's not clear who they think is the top of the chart. It's just pretty clear who they think is near the bottom of the chart. And I think <laughs> yeah, that's, that that's where okay. they focus. That's, that's the more important part of the chart, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Fuck. So now we're in Buddha's doodly do, uh, and this is just pretty much straight the Siddhartha story. His dad's like, "Hey, who's gonna take over if you sit under a tree?" And he's like, "Go fuck yourself." And then his mom is sad because uh, he's gonna go sit under a tree, and he tells her to go fuck herself. And we watch him seeing these memories, and as he's thinking about his mom being sad, his magic tree begins to 
I want to say vape, Marsh. Is it fair to say that the tree vapes? <laughs> so I thought these were some of the hell smells that uh, that in, in, <laughs> infest people. They were sort of seeping up through the roots. And so he's been sort of surrounded by hell smells. Oh. Yeah. So he's he's sitting there. He's beset by hell smells. They start to wrap around his delicious abdomen and his <laughs> tight, tight pecs and run their evil tentacles along his face. I enjoyed this part of the movie. You know what else I'm <laughs> mad about here is the big belly erasure. That's that's a big deal in, in yeah. Buddhism for me. That's like a positive thing. Not enough dad bod, yeah, for sure. <laughs> but then... Dad bod erasure. Brahma gives away the game. He says it's important to enjoy yourself. And Buddha, like a cowboy in an old flick, goes, did you just tell me to enjoy myself? Never! <laughs> and he blasts a golden light out from him, which destroys all the black vape ropes that were holding him. Yeah, and this is this is why we found out that it's not really Brahma, it's the devil in disguise. And by disguise, I mean he looks exactly the same when he is and when he's not Brahma. So it is, it is not a great disguise. And uh, so there's a couple of things I want to point out here. The first is, this is the first time that someone ever goes, never! And then they go, the answer is not to enjoy yourself or to not enjoy yourself. The answer is medium amounts of enjoyment. <laughs> <laughs> and also, another movie first for us, he tells the Brahma that he's the devil. And the devil, for the first time in the history of the show, goes, wow, that's really hurtful, man. I'm really disappointed that you'd be so mean-spirited. I mean, yes, I am the devil, but seriously, that's hurtful. <laughs> and in fact, he's so hurt that he becomes super-duper jacked Black Santa. <laughs> he grows, like, extra pectorials on his pectorials. Yeah, and he gets massive as well. He gets, like, so tall. He's, like, looming over. And we get this incredible battle which is only somewhat undercut by the fact that the hero doesn't move at any point throughout the battle and just sort of <laughs> sits there while it all just happens around him. Okay. If you were hoping for an anime battle where 50% of it was a guy sitting under a tree, um, you're in luck. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, so just to be clear, what's happening in the plot of this movie, the Buddha is having a giant fist fight with mm -hmm. an oversized... Black Santa Claus. Mm -hmm. Well, Black Santa just threw a tornado of screams at him, but Buddha is like meh to the tornado of screams, so it bounces off his Buddha shield. Yeah, like the, the, the less he moves, the more powerful he becomes. And so he just gets more and more still as Black Santa throws everything at him and he reacts to it by not reacting to it. It's an incredibly hmm. dramatic fight. Yeah. It's hard to ramp up the still once you get to still. You yeah. would think that, except now... Black Santa Satan actually gets bigger. He grows a 16 pack and then summons his invincible warriors, which I will tell you was a weird sentence to write in our notes. <laughs> <laughs> but again, he has a flower petter shield and it the, the giant dog evil things don't really. He has a what shield? Uh, a, a flower petal shield. It's like flower petals and they... Blocks the tornado. Blocks the screams. well. No, the tornado of screams was a while ago. These are the invincible oh, warriors. They sorry, sort of come stupid out question. Like dogs. Stupid question. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it. And this is also where Buddha yells, "I will defeat you with the power of wisdom." <laughs> and the the like evil invincible demons are literally blown back by his wisdom. They're like, "He's too wise." <laughs> It's like he learns something every second of every day. <laughs> and Marsh, I need you to tell me if you saw what I saw, because it's spiritually important to me. Buddha's wisdom hits Satan in the dick, right? <laughs> I mean, ma maybe that's what Buddha knows best. You know, that's maybe where his wisdom is centered. He just knows a, a lot about dicks. As, as far as I understood, and listener, you should absolutely watch this movie. It's free on YouTube. As far as I understand it, Satan gets hit in the dick by Buddha's wisdom and then he's like, oh, fuck it, I'm going home and disappears. Yeah, yeah. So you know how you get people who are like, they're not book smart, but they're street smart? Like Buddha's that. He's not book smart, he's dick smart. <laughs> there and you go. That's, he just knows a lot about dick. Yeah. So with Satan defeated, it's time for Buddha to tell us what he learned today. And I guess what he learned is that his family can fuck themselves. <laughs> 
Okay. Yeah. So I started to, I must admit, I was tuning out a little bit here because it was all getting a bit much for me. But does he turn, so it cuts to like a massive hand trying to like grab the Milky Way, like a massive golden hand and then it goes translucent. And then you find out it's Buddha and he's massive and translucent and in space and he can see his hands are see-through and he's bigger than all the galaxies. And then he 100% looks down to try to see his space cock, but there's yes, a galaxy does. right <laughs> in the way of his there space is. cock. <laughs> there is fortunately a censorious galaxy right <laughs> right in the way in Buddha's uh, dingle dangle. So uh, then... It's a decent sized galaxy. It's expanding. Yeah. <laughs> but then Buddha went around teaching everybody about Buddhism and they, they explain, you know, how much everyone loved him. But now it's time for the sermon at Eagle Peak. You know, Eagle Peak, the famous Buddhist mountain where Buddha revealed his alien friends and the laws of the alien sun. Alien friends, laws of the sun, yep. <laughs> because this is where Buddha explains that ever since he was perfect 40 years ago, no big deal. Anyway, try your best to be like him. <laughs> um, he's ready to show them his true form. Which is... Well, we, we do know that his true form can shoot lasers from his forehead <laughs> yep. that turn into massive, massive orbs of light. Mm -hmm. That's a okay. really, really important part of Ooh, his Oh, I bet he could form. mechanically create water with that, too. He could, yeah. <laughs> Just a couple of pyramids set up and we could, we could make some money off this guy. <laughs> <laughs> a literal pyramid scheme right now. <laughs> <laughs> so he shoots a laser out of his head. Multi-water level marketing. <laughs> <laughs> So he shoots a laser out of his head and reveals the ultimate truth that good people are good and bad people are bad. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. And also that sometimes people in hell can get beamed up to heaven, but it seems to be like all they have to do is, is want that to happen. So yeah. huh. they could all just decide they no longer want to be in hell because of how helly it all is. And then they're not in hell anymore. So it seems like a flaw in that whole, that, that previous pyramid scheme we had going on with recruit to 10 more people <laughs> to hell and, and you'll be the one getting all their, uh, their gray smells. Yeah. You just go like, uh, I'm done and you're not in hell anymore. Yeah. It feels like heaven is actually hell because if you can beam yourself from one place to the other but not back, the one you can't leave is hell. That's, <laughs> that's how that works in my head. There you go. <laughs> but don't worry, just as he's explaining this, a giant glowy castle appears behind him. Yeah, he makes a, a spaceship or a building or a tower or something out of nowhere and it beams him up and gives him a really sweet golden hat. Yeah. And I want to point out that there's this <laughs> the amazing moment happening? in the movie here where he gets beamed up by the Goldie Tower thing that just got created behind him. Mm. But then he comes literally right back. Yeah, like, immediately straight back again. <laughs> But he's got red sauerkraut with him this time. <laughs> and he's like, hey, this is my friend, uh, Raja Ghoul or whatever. Uh, I dare you to try to picture us not fucking. You can't. It's impossible. Uh, line up afterwards if you know what I'm saying. And, and this is the bit where Buddha just starts to show them footage from earlier in the film. Yeah! <laughs> he shows them earlier in the film, sort of explains the plot so far. It might be fair to say that he sums up the movie. Mm -hmm. And then, okay, this, this is going to be a deep cut, but he Crimes of Grindelwald's for all of Buddha's followers. <laughs> you remember in Crimes of Grindelwald, the Harry Potter movie, where he blows the smoke for all the wizards and they see the Holocaust in World War II, and he's like, hey, this is probably a bad thing. That's what Buddha's going to do for everybody right now. Mm. But don't worry, because eventually there will be a small tax evasion scam based out of Japan. <laughs> 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 yeah he says about how uh you know he shows some nazis nuclear weapons real buzzkill kind of stuff and then he says but don't worry the sun will rise again which sounds a bit nationalistic coming from a japanese group <laughs> about yeah. the empire of the rising sun it's a bit that really it's a little on the nose yeah, yeah. And then you get loads of sparkly aliens that arrive asking for asking buddha for information about the sun this is the best other aliens who we will never be introduced to mm -mm. and will never be explained, mm -mm. show up to this speech like wedding crashers and are like, <laughs> hi, sorry, sorry. We just wanted to hear what Buddha had to say. Yeah. And they say like, so so they say like, let us make a utopia on earth. It's like, no, I'm going to like cause a, an earthquake so that fire angels can appear out of the ground instead. 
And that's kind of what Buddha does at this point. Instead of doing the utopia thing, he does the earthquake fire angels who, and the fire angels are, are shape-shifting to have different forms, some of which have wings, some of them don't. I'm really confused by a yeah. lot of this. In my notes, I call them wacky, inflatable, waving arm, flailing tube <laughs> angels because <laughs> that's how they appear. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. They need to workshop the stuff they invent. Like they did the proto heroin. It went real badly. They did atomic power and nukes. And now they're doing evil flying. Ain't what, what was the, th the last one? They're wacky, uh, inflatable, waving, arm flailing tube angels. But <laughs> okay. it turns out that those that one sounds better. wacky, inflatable, waving, arm flailing tube angels are his disciples, which is everyone in the crowd of the speech he's giving. And then all the Buddhist monks, stay with me, Heath, do not let go. <laughs> all the Buddhist monks are revealed to be characters from earlier incarnations of El Cantare, like mm -hmm. Jew guy and lady who hates her son <laughs> and guy who didn't want to pray. And there are other characters. Yeah, woman, in, woman in the hospital, old woman guy who hospital. falls over. It all, no, the, the kid who is going to be sacrificed, it all kind of comes together like the reveal at the end of Usual Suspects. But the only thing that was really clear <laughs> was that all these characters had the same face throughout history. Like, you know, th this, this girl had the same face. But I didn't think that was kind of a, a through line ingenious thread. I just thought it was poor artistic talent. Like when you get uh, one of those tourist artists in like a square in Paris and they they kind of, they draw tourists, but everyone starts off with the same eyes, nose and mouth. So you just got a different hat and you're, you're holding a skateboard because you said you like skateboards. That, that's what it felt like was going on here. Yeah, I thought that maybe they had bought a certain amount of anime models and like a... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll give you more, these 16 characters. But no, it, it turns out that everyone who follows Buddha has been incarnating over and over and over again so that they can teach the laws of the sun in 2,500 years when he will incarnate in his final and most perfect form. Mm -hmm. 2,500 years from the present? Uh, no, from, from when Buddha point. died. About 2,500 years ago, ish. Spoiler alert. Oh, so now that should have happened sometime since 1986. Yeah. He's talking about the guy who's the head of their cult right now. Yeah. Got it. Spoiler alert. <laughs> also, this whole thing about they need to go and spread the laws of the sun throughout the world. I wrote in my notes, quick question, what are the laws of the sun? Like name <laughs> one law. What are they? Huh. What are we talking about? What is the law? Learn something every second. <laughs> is that one of the laws? <laughs> it may be. I don't know. They are. They never really nail those yeah, down. The, um... But this That's this film it. was called The Laws of the Sun, in which Buddha repeatedly comes to Earth in several different forms to teach people the laws of the sun. And I realized at this point in the film, I hadn't picked up a single law of the sun or noticed them <laughs> being, <laughs> being taught. <laughs> but he, don't act now, because he's not just going to incarnate in his most perfect form. He will also purify the entire world. Mm -hmm. illuminate Great. hell and free everyone there, which uh, hmm. credit where credit's due, way more moral than Christianity. <laughs> <laughs> and thus will begin the age of the sun. And I, I just want to say it takes a certain amount of cojones to make a one hour and 44 minute animated film about how you are the super duper spiritual perfection of Buddha, El Cantare, and thought. <laughs> And then we cut forward to Buddha's death, which is sad. Although I will point out there are elephants that have come to watch Buddha die. And I really wanted him to be like, uh, could someone move the elephants to the front? I would love to thank them for coming. It's just could not have been an easy commute for two elephants to make it to my death. <laughs> Oh, and this is where he sort of floats goldily out of his sleeping body. Mm -hmm. Which, to be fair, not a bad exit. You've done all right there. And he meets all of his prior selves. So you see him as Thoth and you see him as as uh, the crowd fella. You see him as the Greek one who looks like he's been hit in the face by something heavy. That was not one of his good looks. <laughs> no. It didn't last long. <laughs> but all these different hymns kind of Voltron into him in this kind of weird golden person shape that looks like it's made out of melted butter. And then that turns into a circle mm. that gets covered in electrical circuits, then that evaporates and then it explodes into golden bubbles that reveals a red burning sun at the centre. And then we cut to what is basically a, like a Windows Vista screensaver. I think that's what I <laughs> yeah. saw. Well, it's not just that. It's a Windows <laughs> Vista screensaver, which then zooms out to be the title, mm. The Laws of the Sun. 
Yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> hey, snakes on a plane can suck this movie's dick. Buddha turns into the name of this movie. <laughs> <laughs> But again, they never tell us what those laws are at any moment. They're no, not going to close no, with that. No. no, they do not. So, uh, and this isn't quite the end. You know, we get nope. to see those those you know those, those five people around the pentagonal table. We see them for about <laughs> three tenths of a second, and then we leave. No idea who they are. We just quick, quick goodbye to them, and and we 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 fuck off again. All right. What if we do an irregular pentagon? Maybe we could push them together like flat. Uh, <laughs> no, no, it just looks stupid. All yeah. right. So right. we get a quick summary of the crazy in our final scene here. Uh, it's basically just going through everything that happened in the movie. Oh, oh, and this is where we see the, the sparkles of Buddha's influence and Alcantara's influence start to spread from Atlantis out and from, from uh, it goes Atlantis into North America and Middle East and Europe. And you can see it goes into Europe and then it gets to England and the kind of enlightenment doesn't make it to Scotland. And uh, you know what? It, it, it still hasn't. Suck it, Glasgow. It still hasn't. More shots fired. <laughs> fuck Scotland, fuck Australia. That's because El Cantare hasn't been born as Brian Ego yet. So there you go. <laughs> so yeah, we go through the whole movie. And then I got to say, this is pretty amazing. Mm. We get a, a live shot of the guy who is the head of this cult, Ryuno Okawa. Yeah, who claims yeah. to be ultimate Buddha, who has been depicted in his various incarnations as rippling pecs and chiseled jaw. And he looks, he looks like a penis accountant. But he looks, <laughs> if, if low sperm count could have an accountant, I put a picture of him in the notes just so Heath could see. <laughs> but really, go ahead and Google the head of the happy science cult. And keep in mind that this guy made an hour and 44 minute animated movie about he is the incarnation of the ultimate Buddha. Bear in mind, <laughs> this is what the chap looks like. Now imagine, imagine watching a three hour film of him doing an impersonation of Princess Diana <laughs> as he channels her spirit <laughs> and tells you in great detail about her thoughts about uh, the British uh, aristocracy and British society, uh, but somehow keeps forgetting the name of her own children. That keeps slipping out of his, uh, out of her, sorry, her brain uh, throughout the conversation. You've got to get this guy on Be Reasonable. Oh, oh God, I wish. I, I did invite Happy Science as a cult on and uh, they politely turned me down. Oh, and it's a shame because they were really, really friendly, but so weird. So it's, weird. It's the happy. That's the happy. Mm. It's at the start right there. <laughs> they come on, you just start reading them facts once a second. Listen, guys. <laughs> <laughs> and that, Heath Enright, is the movie The Laws of the Sun. Okay, that's the noise of my thoughts right now. <laughs> I have no idea what just happened. I don't think Eli and Marsh do either. Do you guys have any? I, you don't. <laughs> you don't. But let's try to sum it all up with a little brevity. If this movie was a, you know, like a TLDR haiku, how would it go? So I, 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 I've got two that I think are, uh, sum it up for me. Um, if you are evil, your world will sink beneath waves. So, like, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> May or may not happen in three phases. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, and I also had a uh, golden alien guy comes, leaves, returns, leaves, etc. That, <laughs> but on a loop. Fantastic. <laughs> well done. Well done. All right. You could have saved us a lot of time with that haiku at the beginning, Marsh. Thank you, though. All right. Well, well, that does it for the laws of the sun. That's not going to do it for the episode just yet because they do not stop making terrible movies. We're going to be back next week. So tell us, Eli, what's on deck. Like Zarthustra before her, Carissa and Maria spoke it into existence. We'll be doing Heaven's Gate and Hell's Flames. She spake it. All right. <laughs> well, with that to look forward to, we're going to wrap it up. As always, big thanks to Marsh for joining us. Just in case anyone's new and they want to hear some more Marsh, where should they go? So you can check out my day job where I'm a full-time skeptical activist at uh, the Good Thinking Society. So like Google that and you'll come across the various places that we are on there. And I just recently worked with the BBC on a major documentary on uh, alternative cancer cures, which is kind of, I think, one of the most important stories I've ever told. And, and hopefully we'll, we'll have a kind of the most, one of the ones that will have the most effect in terms of protecting people. And I tell... And that went out on episode 281 of Skeptics of the K, where I, I tell a story of a particular cancer patient that I've been trying to tell for five years now, and we finally got the story out there. So I'm really, really proud of the work we've done to get that out there. And if, if people look to uh, that episode in particular, 281 of Skeptics of the K, you can hear some of the work we're doing. 
Fantastic. You can almost learn a new fact every second by listening to Marsh on his other serious shows where he does real things that are awesome for the world. All right. Once again, a huge thanks to all the patrons who help make this show go. If you'd like to count yourself among their ranks, you can make a per episode donation at patreon.com slash godawful and thereby earn early access to an ad-free version of every episode. You can also help us out a ton by leaving us a five-star review on iTunes and by sharing the show on all your various social media platforms. And if you enjoyed this show, be sure to check out our sibling shows, The Scathing Atheist, Citation Needed, and The Skeptocrat, available on iTunes, Stitcher, and wherever else podcasts live. If you have questions, comments, or cinematic suggestions, you can email godawfulmovies at gmail.com. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Our theme song was written and performed by Ryan Slotnick, Field Drafts on Mars. All other music was written and performed by our audio engineer, Morgan Clark, and was used with permission. Thanks again for giving us a chunk of your life this week. For Eli Bosnick and Michael Marshall, I'm Heath Enright, promising to work hard to earn another chunk next week. Until then, we'll leave you with the Animal House clothes. The Happy Science Cult may very well have sent themselves ricin in an attempt to get publicity and accidentally killed several dozen of their that members. Really, really <laughs> might have happened. Heath went on to send Cincinnati Bell a lovely edible arrangement. <laughs> Marsh still has no fucking clue what any of the laws of the sun are. <laughs> Going down to interstitials. Yeah. Time out. Time out. I'm scrolling badly. Time out. Oh, time in. <laughs> <laughs> I won still. I don't know why I stopped when you said time out. Did Everyone you stop? I did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're an honest man. That's integrity right there. <laughs> so I kept getting distracted by all of the things that that uh, that you were saying, Heath, because I know you don't know what they mean, and I do. And I'm like, Fuck me, this was as ridiculous as that. <laughs> I just read everything phonetically just now. <laughs> Like Zarthustra before her, Carissa and Maria spoke it into existence. We'll be doing Heaven's Gate and Hell's Flames. She spake it. All right. <laughs> well, that pronunciation of Zarathustra and you went after spake. I was going to, that's, it's too much. We're not, we can't, we can think about it. <laughs> None of this is usable. <laughs> he was just going to be like, hey, well, Heath, I'll tell you, Heaven's Gate and Hell's Flames. Oop, I pooped again. Mangoes. Poop, mangoes, mangoes, poop. Well, now you now that you've gave, given him that, <laughs> yeah, I gave him the better he's audio. Gonna <laughs> he's gonna move. These. You guys could pretend I'm dead for like a month <laughs> using that audio. <laughs> the preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm LLC. Copyright 2021. All rights reserved.